Good morning. Welcome to worship on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. It's a special day as we have a congregational meeting following this service. We hope you will stay. Please stand at this time as you are able and face to the processional cross. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Beloved of God, called to be saints, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to be to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Numbers. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was dis displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when that spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, and Joshua son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would his, put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord.
A reading from James. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any one among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. All right, if any of my young friends would like to come forward now for the children's sermon, I invite you to do so. All right. Any others? Okay. All right. It's going to be the three of us today. What do I have here in our children's sermon basket? A newspaper. Yeah, yeah. It's really not a trick question. Yeah, have a newspaper here. All right. What do you see in the picture there? on the front page, that just a bunch of people right here. Yeah, so in town yesterday we had a big race, uh, a running race, and a whole lot of people showed up for it. So that's a news story, and uh, news stories are what we see in newspapers. And do you know what a journalist is? We actually have one in the room here, or at least I saw him earlier. <laughs> there he is, back there, yeah. So journalists, they will often go to events like, say, this one, the race, and they'll ask questions, and then they will write a story about what is happening. That way other people can know what is happening around them. And there are some words that are called the question words. Have you learned about those in school yet? I'm sure you've heard these words before, but they are the questions, or they are the words, who, what, why, when, where, and how. That's a lot, isn't it? All right, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, if, if we have those words start our questions, it helps us get a better understanding of what's going on. And so a journalist will go ask those questions. And here, do you want to hold this? Christian, do you want to hold that? Yeah. So, when, uh, so we have those questions. And in the lesson that Mr. Ivan just read for us, uh, it was from the, the letter from someone named James, and it's talking about something. I'm going to ask the, those questions. All right, and, it's, um, and so the first question is who? And when we think about it, it's like, well, he, James is talking about God. And so we're supposed to go to, to God. And so what? What do we go to God with? What do you... Or answer me this. What do you think we go to God with? Do we go to God with prayer? Yeah, we do, with prayer. All right. Uh, who, what, when? When do we pray? When do you pray at home? Do you pray at home? Do you pray here? Could you pray when you're just walking around? Yeah, so you can pray uh, any time. Who, what, when, when is any time, where, yeah, we can pray anywhere, can't we? Uh, who, what, when, where, why? So that's the big question. Why do you think we should pray anytime, anywhere? It's because God loves us. Yeah, God loves us and God wants us to know that God is always with us and present with us. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? And, and so, how, how is it that God loves us? God loves us by coming to us in Jesus Christ and telling us about all the love, grace, and forgiveness that God offers to us. 
So I hope you remember that, that that was the point of what James was trying to write in the lesson that we just heard. And it's a lot like a journalist in asking those questions. All right, can I have that back for the next one? And now let's pray. Let's fold our hands together and we're going to pray. Dear God, Thank you for sending Jesus. Help me to remember to always pray. Amen. All right, thank you all so much. You can go back to your seats now. Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, and to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm neither, never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire." Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We've been walking through Mark's gospel for a while now, and one characteristic of Mark's gospel that stands out from the other gospels is how he portrays the disciples. According to Mark, these 12 men were absolute fools. (laughs) There's no sugarcoating it. (laughs) These guys never seem to pick up on what Jesus is teaching, and he is constantly going to extra lengths to explain the lesson that he just taught them. And today's gospel lesson seems to incoherently jump around everywhere to different themes. However, today's lesson makes more sense when we keep two things in mind. First, This is part of an ongoing story that picks up where last week's lesson left off. And second, the only thing that makes this story coherent is the backdrop of the disciples' foolishness. In the recent readings we've had from Mark, the issue of selfishness is repeatedly brought up. It begins with Jesus' teaching that selfishness tends to be the source of evil that arises from the human heart. 
And then Jesus chides the disciples for their selfish ambition when they argue over which one of them is the greatest disciple. In response, he lifts up a child, symbolic of the marginalized and the vulnerable people in society. And he says that greatness is found in welcoming people like these. In fact, he points out when the disciples welcome someone without status into their own company, they are welcoming God and Jesus. And that's where today's lesson picks up. The disciple John effectively responds to Jesus' teaching about welcoming by saying to him, there are still some people we can exclude, right? And he's referring to a man who isn't one of the 12 disciples, but who is casting out demons in Jesus' name. We can exclude that guy, right? And John spills the beans when he finishes by saying, we tried to stop him because he was not following us. John could have said, we tried to stop him because he was not following you, Jesus, but he didn't say that. John was concerned that the man wasn't following us. We can hear this two different ways. First, if Jesus isn't included in the us, then clearly the disciples are wrong in thinking that people should be following them and not Jesus. So let's give John the benefit of the doubt and hear the us as including Jesus. And that is still problematic. If Jesus is included in the us, then it means the disciples have placed themselves on the same level as Jesus. And everybody should be following not just Jesus, but us. And that understanding of us is on one hand idolatrous, and on the other hand, it's discriminatory. It places the disciples on a higher level than everyone else. It is as though the disciples weren't paying attention when Jesus had just dismantled their concept of greatness by saying that true greatness is found when we welcome even the most vulnerable people as our own equals. Almost always, when people want to exclude others, to kick them out or to treat them as lessers, their, their reason is found in a sense of superiority. These disciples desperately want to be great, and they seem to think that they are great. However, they cannot wrap their minds around the idea that excluding others does not need to be involved in their definition of greatness. Probably thoughts of childhood exclusion have come to mind. You know how some kids seek to rise to the top of the social ladder, even if it means pushing others down. To be honest, this isn't something that only occurs in middle school, though. We still see adults seeking to become great in their own way at the expense of others. Everyone is capable of following it, falling into this, no matter their age. When I was a pastor in Columbia, one of my parishioners lived in a retirement apartment complex. And when I would visit, she would tell me about the people who lived there. I had assumed that the man who always sat at the front door of the building was the welcoming committee, but she told me he was actually the biggest purveyor of gossip there. <laughs> also, every resident knew not to sit at a certain dinner table because the women who always sat there would just roll their eyes at anyone who tried to join them, and then they would proceed to ignore their guest for the whole meal. I was glued to these stories because it was all the social dynamics found in the movie Mean Girls but instead of taking place in high school, it was a retirement community. <laughs> when the disciple John says he desires to exclude a man for not following us, Jesus replied with words akin to, that man is doing good for other people, which is what I'm trying to do. Don't get in his way. And Jesus then says, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink 
because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. That, in effect, is saying, this man isn't carrying our banner, and the Father and I can handle that when the time is suitable. In the meantime, don't stand in the way of people doing good. And this brief interaction concerning this man resonates even today. How many people wave the banner of Christianity for their own advantage, but then become an obstacle for actually doing some good for their neighbor? Jesus asks us to place our attention on the fruit of their work. Are they helping by meeting people's real needs, symbolized by a drink of water? Or are they lifting that banner in order to gain power? Too often, raising the banner of Christianity is done to point out other people's faults. It is even justified by trying to help them out of their sins. But ultimately, what is being done is that it is excluding the other person. And when that is done, even today, it is once again Jesus' disciples failing to comprehend his teaching. The tendency to point out faults in others is a trap. Jesus warns against a stumbling block in today's lesson, and the root of that word in Greek describes setting a trap. So when Jesus warns against placing stumbling blocks before little ones in the faith, it is a warning against finding something wrong with another person and using that as an excuse to exclude them from Christian fellowship. He taught that 2,000 years ago, but his disciples throughout history have struggled with this teaching to welcome people with no strings attached. What is the best way to fight our tendency to set traps for people whom we find unfavorable? What is the remedy that will move us to be welcoming people of all people? And the answer is self-examination. To see how we have our own faults, and frankly, we should pay more attention to those than to the faults that we see in others. So Jesus then transitions to offering some examples to us of this self-examination. If your hand causes you to uh, stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. This is clearly hyperbole. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want anyone to actually do that. The whole point of hyperbole is to shock the listener into seeing a different viewpoint. The disciples haven't comprehended that they need to welcome others with no strings attached. The disciples still want to find reasons to exclude other people, to push them away, so Jesus resorts to hyperbole to get this point across. If you are going to examine someone for their faults, make sure that someone is yourself, not anyone else. And Jesus wraps this up by talking about two kinds of fire. Fire that destroys and fire that purifies. Our lesson describes the first fire as hell. But that translation sends our minds into thinking about medieval views of the afterlife. The word that Jesus uses in Greek is Gehenna, Gehenna, which is the name of an actual valley that is just south of Jerusalem. Long before Jesus, child sacrifices were performed there by pagans. And during Jesus' day, it was the trash dump for the city of Jerusalem. And there was a constant smoldering fire in this valley to burn the refuse. But for those reasons, no one wanted to go there. You can visit there today. I've been there, so I can truly say that I've been to Gehenna and back. <laughs> when our translation today has Jesus warn about being thrown into hell, try not to hear that as a warning about the afterlife. Rather, hear it as a hyperbolic, yeah, hyperbolic warning 
about life right now. He, in effect, is saying, if you call yourself my follower, but you are not willing to welcome, with no strings attached, even the most vulnerable and marginalized people, then you have effectively removed yourself from my kingdom in this world right now and have thrown yourself into that derided, burning trash heap we call Gehenna. Sure, it's hyperbole, but it effectively gets his point across. Welcome all, or else you are missing out on the good news of my kingdom for this life right here and now. And Jesus finishes by referring to the second type of fire, the fire that purifies. Jesus knows it is hard for us to examine ourselves and to look at our own faults, but that is what he alludes to by mentioning a purifying fire. It is difficult to let go of our prejudices in order to be truly welcoming. However, purifying ourselves of such prejudice is a good thing even if it makes us uncomfortable. Pastor Chelsea Harmon has this to say about our call to self-reflection and our call to be welcoming of others. Suffering a little now for the sake of becoming more like God instead of trying to be God, giving up now the things like sin that don't belong to God so that we might begin to experience the joys of heaven even in this life, this is what it means to lose our lives in order to gain it. May we listen to the Lord and seek to grow in the life that he desires for us all. May we examine ourselves and our hearts and pray that our hearts will be open to welcoming others just as God welcomes us. And may this process, as challenging as self-examination may be, may it renew us and bring us into the fullness of life that Christ desires for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He is seated in his heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Bless the newly baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for natural wonders of your creation, including Francis Marion National Forest, the Low Country beaches and marshes, and the Ashley, Cooper, and Wando Rivers. Restore damaged forests, waterways, and natural habitats, and lead us to be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. Draw close to all in need. We especially pray for Ralph, Lynn, Irma, Elizabeth, Grace, Bill, Bill, Doug, Doug. Marie, Marie, Stephen, Stephen Chuck, Chuck, Carolyn, Carolyn Claire, Claire, Betty, Betty, and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the worship leaders of all Saints Lutheran Church, musicians, lectors, assisting ministers, altar guild, greeters, and ushers. Bless us through their ministry and grant them the passion to continue in their service. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat and drink the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may live in him and he in us, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, come, the table is ready. Thanks be to God.
This is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a few announcements. As mentioned before, we do have a special congregational meeting. It starts at 10. And the only item on the agenda is to vote on the Renew, Rebuild, Rejoice campaign to refresh our building and grounds. So please, we do need a quorum. So if you're a voting member, try your best to be back there. We're going to go straight back to the Kessner Center. If you need to drive back there or even drive onto the grass around the right-hand side to get closer, that is fine. Just watch out for pedestrians. Uh, We want you to be safe when you're getting back there. Um, And In addition to our meeting, since that doesn't start till 10, we're going to have a little refreshment reception ahead of time just to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to some of the folks that joined our church during drive-in worship. It was hard to greet everybody when we were all stuck in our cars. And so I do want to recognize those folks now. If you are here at this service and I read out your name, if you don't mind Just stand up and give us a little wave so we can see who you are. And then when we go back to the Kessner Center, there'll be a table set up. We are going to do it outside since it's nice weather uh, with some refreshments and some little gifts for you to take home today. So, Mr. Jim Bennett. Jim. Jim's grandson, Max, also joined the church during drive-in because he was baptized Uh, Jay Haney, Ethan Huff, and Kara Stewart are 11 o'clock folks. Um, Carol King, Allison and Kevin Counts, Kathy Murphy, Ann Neidert, Angie and Joyce Sereno. And then we also, there, stand up, give us a wave. And we also uh, baptized Miss Rebecca Rose Sawicki during drive-in worship. So welcome officially. We're so happy that you're with us. And please take a moment to go have some refreshments out by the Kessner Center with us. We also have a photographer that would like to snap your photo while you're back there so that we can have one for our records and for our bulletin board. So um, we're going to go do that in just a minute here. Um, If you have any questions... Um, about the, um, the vote. We have a little question-answer discussion time back there during the meeting. All right, I think that's all of our announcements. So we will continue with our benediction. Please stand as you are able. People of God, you are Christ's body bringing new life to a suffering world the Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen.
Beloved of God, I forgot someone. Miss Nancy Jones. There's Nancy back there. Make sure you introduce yourself to Miss Nancy. I'm sorry, Nancy. But also, you have been called to be the saints. So whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Don't peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.